last few weeks, we've been in this series connected to transformational verses. And pastor, when he talked to us, pastor, campus pastors, executive team, one of the things he started sharing is these are verses that have impacted his life. These are verses that have also impacted this church, and you see them embedded in his sermons, in his teachings, in our small groups, and today I get the opportunity to share one of those verses that pertains to me, one of those verses that has impacted my life, has challenged me, and has made me think differently than the way I used to, and what I want to talk to you today is about honor. Honor is, I believe, a lost virtue in American society. When you look at honor, we have just misconstrued what the God of heart means when it comes to honor. When you look at honor, I mean, and you see it everywhere. Honor is overlooked everywhere. The classrooms have become chaotic. The workplace, there is pandemonium in the workplace. You have public discourse developing in ways that probably have hit their lowest points, at least in recent history. And it is very easy for us to dishonor one another, even in social media. And just it's just culture has had a tremendous impact in the concept of honor. But I believe, honestly and sincerely, that what I'm about to share with you regarding honor will impact your marriage, will impact your singleness, will impact the way you relate with your kids, will impact your spiritual growth, will impact the way you relate with other people at work, with your boss, with your, with your employees, with your team, with your staff. When you follow God's blueprint for your life as a follower of Christ and as a disciple of Christ, you get God's best in your life. So I want to encourage you to to listen up, pay attention, focus, and I want to share with you over the next few minutes just instances in which reflect the heart of God, examples of when the heart of God regarding honor has been illustrated. Mark chapter 6, and that's one of my favorite passages, and my my favorite verse is Mark 6, 6. He was amazed. But I'm going to give you some context for you to know. When it says he, it it makes reference to Jesus. He was amazed. Verse 1 says, Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aaron, his sisters here with us, and they took offense at him. And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own town, among his relatives, In his own home, he could not do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. He was amazed at their lack of faith. And over the next few minutes, I just want to unpack those verses so that we get a better understanding of how Jesus responded, why he responded the way he did, and the impact that the way these people dishonored Jesus had in their lives in their families, in their bodies, and in their own spiritual growth, including their ability to not recognize the Messiah who was in front of them. Jesus left there. I'll start breaking it down from verse 1. Jesus left there. What it means is he was really in Capernaum, 20 miles north, and he was pretty much around that region ministering, but he had come down to his village, to Nazareth. He had been there the year before. They tried to kill him by throwing him off a cliff. He returns to Nazareth because God is a God of second chances. They had rejected him, but he came back because God always reaches you at your lowest points and wherever you are. So he comes back to Nazareth. Nazareth is a little village. Most 
Theologians will agree that it was probably 300, 350 people, people with a so low social economic status, probably low educational level. He was no longer in Jerusalem where the religious elite was, where the people that were learning and growing, they were not there. He came to Nazareth. He had already been rejected by the scholars. Now he comes to a bunch of humble people and he's rejected as well. I mean, we know nothing about Nazareth pretty much in history other than, than, than Nathaniel saying what good can come out of Nazareth. But Jesus came out of Nazareth. So he's accompanied by his disciples, which means he was probably there on a business trip, not necessarily or not only just coming to visit family. Jesus takes advantage of every opportunity. His disciples are coming with him. He is teaching them along the way. He's healing. People are seeing miracles. Things are shifting, growing, and changing. They kind of left them alone, but when the Sabbath came, when the Sabbath came, they're all in church and they start talking, <laughs> but they're not talking good things. They're, they're talking trash. I mean, the first question they ask is, where did this man get these things? In other words, isn't this the one that went with little Josie to school a few years ago? Isn't this the same guy that grew up here in Nazareth? But Jesus, when he spoke, he spoke with such authority. He spoke like he knew, like he could see biblical principles, like he could understand beyond any rabbi they could see. But they're like, who is this guy? Who is this guy? I mean, he was a carpenter. How did he go from a carpenter to a rabbi? We don't even know. We don't even know under who did he learn. Here, they're wondering and marveling about their wisdom because he had a way to take old truths and declare them in new ways. His works, I mean, he had notoriety. He had been working miracles all throughout. Granted, he couldn't do anything in Nazareth, but they had heard it through social media, I guess, some kind of social media, because they knew about the miracles that he had performed. In verse 3, they say, isn't this the carpenter? You know what that means, right? He ain't no pastor. He ain't no rabbi. He is a carpenter. He got no schooling. Who does he think he is to talk to us the way he does? He's no better than us. That's really how they started gossiping in church, right? You want some more? It gets good. Verse number three, they says, the second part, isn't this Mary's son? And you think, how cute. But that's one of the biggest insults you could see in scripture. You see, they come, this is, they all come from a patriarchal society, which means they had a patrilineal it was a patrilineal society, which meant the son was identified by the last or the name of the father. And you never would call somebody son of Mary. You would never call anybody Jesus bar Mary. Bar means son of Mary. He would have been called Jesus bar Joseph. Jesus, the son of Joseph. But you see what they're saying here? Isn't this the son of Mary? You know what that means? We know your mama, but we don't know who your daddy is. Because your parents, this is a small town, and in small town, people don't forget. You know that? I come from a small town. Small town, they remember everything. They got married in June, and they had a baby in September. <laughs> and that was Jesus. We know who your mother is, but we don't know who your father is. A man that didn't have a father was a man without an identity. A man without purpose, a man without a lineage, a man without a reputation. And they're saying, you are nobody. Do you get that? <laughs> isn't, isn't this one the son of Mary? They're really insulting him to the top. And what's interesting is Jesus' response. <laughs> In a society like that, a society like ours, you don't mess with anybody's mama, do you? <laughs> they were messing with his mama. They were calling her something that was not very nice. Just if you didn't get that on verse 3. But his response, which teaches us about Jesus' response, he could not do any miracles except lay hands. And then he goes to explain why. In other words, he had been healing the blind were saying, the deaf were hearing, the cripple were just jumping. He had resurrected a couple of people there. He goes into Nazareth and he couldn't. I'm talking about the Messiah, the Son of God, the fullness of the Spirit of God is in him. Yeah. And it doesn't say he wouldn't do a miracle. It says he couldn't do a miracle. Are you with me? Yeah. So something that hinders Jesus 
is something that I want to learn about because if it hindered Jesus, the Son of God is going to hinder my life. And this is what happens. He goes on to explain. He goes on to explain. And it says, he was amazed at their lack of faith. He, he, he was blown away. And this is, this is when Jesus heard this. When Jesus heard this, he said he was amazed. He couldn't believe it. And it kept him from performing miracles. Instead of having faith, instead of honoring him, they dishonored him. And do you know what? There's only two times in Scripture in which Jesus was amazed. Two times in Scripture. And I want to know, how do you amaze Jesus? <laughs> do you want to know how do you amaze Jesus? Two of you, welcome to the house of the Lord. <laughs> the rest of you, you should probably be thinking about amazing Jesus and not anybody else. But how do we amaze Jesus? Two times in Scripture. One is Mark 6.6. 6. The second time is Matthew 8. And I'm going to read it to you. Because in both instances, it has to do with faith, has to do with honor, and has to do with authority. Faith, honor, and authority in both occasions. One time he was amazed by their lack of faith, the way they dishonored him. Then the next passage, which leads us to Matthew 5, Matthew 8, verse 5, when Jesus returned to Capernaum, he was still in the region. This was really the home base of Jesus' ministry. A Roman officer came and pleaded with him. Lord, my young servant lies in bed, paralyzed in terrible, terrible pain. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. I will come and heal him. But the officer said, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come into my house. Just say the word. Just say the word. From where you are, and my servant will be healed. I mean, this is an officer of the Roman Empire. This is like a four-star general of the United States going into Afghanistan, talking to a carpenter in rural Afghanistan and saying, you are not worthy of coming into my house. Can you have the picture of that? Can you see the kind of honor this man, this, this general, this officer of the Roman Empire was bestowing towards Jesus? And this is what happened. Next, next look. I know this. He explains why. Why have his action? I know this because I am under authority of my superior officers. And I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go and they go. Or come and they come. What is he saying? I know who you are, Jesus. And I know the authority that has been delegated to you. All you got to do is say the word and those demons will flee from my soldier. He had such level and such honor towards Jesus that you know what happened? Jesus was amazed. Jesus was amazed. Verse 10, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to those who were following he never wasted an opportunity to teach and lead. He said, I tell you the truth, I never seen faith like this in all of Israel. That included Mary, the mother of Jesus. That included John the Baptist. John the Baptist probably knew more scripture, but this Roman centurion had more faith. That, he, they, he had more faith than John the Baptist together with all the disciples. I've, I haven't seen anything like this in all of Israel. Why? Because this man understood the heart of God towards honor. It changed his life. It changed his life. He had more faith, although he had less of a religious background. He had more faith, less training. More faith, less education. But he understood the heart of God when it came to honor. Do you want to amaze Jesus? This is the second chance I give you. Do you want to amaze Jesus? Thank you very much. I'd like you to talk back to me so that we could, we could, we could talk. All right. You're all now are on the same page. Well, I have news. <laughs> Amazing Jesus is the easy part. <laughs> Amazing Jesus is the easy part. We want the full reward. We want to amaze him. We agree on that. We want to see him move in our lives. Well, in order for that to happen, we have to understand, how does Jesus take honor to a whole nother level? Are you ready for that? You may not, but I'll, I'm going to tell you anyways. <laughs> this is a lot of fun, and I hope it challenges you. If you want to amaze Jesus, we have to understand the heart of honor and how it impacts all of our life. 
John 13, 20 says, Very truly I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me. And whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. Are you with me? Jesus is saying something right there. I'm, I'm going to change this a little bit. Very truly I tell you, whoever honors anyone I send honors me. And whoever accepts honors me honors the one who who sent me. When you honor, when you accept somebody, you're showing hospitality, you're showing honor, you're showing acceptance, right? So Paul takes this whole concept and he kind of reworks it and explains it even better. He says, for all authority comes from God. That's Romans 13, first part of the verse. If you don't like it, don't throw stones at me yet. For all authority comes from God, because we're ready for this right. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. A lot of Christians don't like this verse. I just read it, and some of you are like, mm -hmm, I don't know where this is going. Where's Pastor Brian? <laughs> when is he back? When is he back? <laughs> they don't like it. You don't like it. We don't like it, right? Because we have experienced or seen the abuse of authority, the misuse authority, authority that has been cruel, abusive, and dishonest authority. But like I said, it is easier to honor Jesus. It gets more difficult when it's required for you or me to honor someone else. So practically, how does this look like in the 21st century? There's four areas, four areas that I believe will group authority delegated from God into our lives. And one of them is civil authority, family authority, social authority, and the last one is church authority, just in case you had not been offended yet. <laughs> what, does Bible, what does the Bible say in Romans 13 about civil authority? That's the president, the vice president, all the way to the police officer uh, on the street, right? So I remember being, being in Belize a few years back, part of a missions project that we had as part of North Place, I was overseeing that project. We were building camps. We were building uh, wells, water wells. We were reaching to rural pastors. And I remember on one of those trips, I'm with the missionary. And in the, on that trip, we were, we were headed to one of the projects. But he said, I got to make a quick stop for a minute because I got to follow up. I got to connect with the commissioner the police commissioner, the highest ranking police or the second highest ranking, it was actually the deputy commissioner, the deputy commissioner. He said, I got to stop. Do you want to go with me? I said, sure. I got no place to be and I'm in your car, so let's do it. So I'm sitting there. I'm sitting there. It was not a spiritual response, but it was a real response. So it's the deputy commissioner, I said, I'll be curious to sit in the commissioner's office. I've never done that. <laughs> so he was there behind the desk, the missionary. I'm sitting right there. They're talking about the kingdom and influence and politics. And then he looks at me and says, well, who are you? <laughs> I said, well, I'm John Cruz. I'm a pastor in Dallas, and I'm with the missionary today. Grateful to be here, sir. <laughs> it's, a, it's an honor to me be here with you. He's like, so what do you do in addition to being a pastor? And I said, well, before I was a pastor, I was an organizational psychologist, and I did organizational assessments for different companies. And he said, well, tell me a little bit more about those organizational assessments. So I went on to explain the pieces, parts, and the impact of that. And he said, I want you to do uh, one of those organizational assessments for the north region of our country. <laughs> I think, I got no idea what you're talking about. I mean, I've done... Candy stores, pharmaceuticals, <laughs> never done no police department, right? So, so I, I, and I'm like, this is not what I'm here to do. This is not what I'm here to do. But the Lord reminded me of Romans 13. All authority is delegated by God. That man was in authority. And I was in his country as a guest. And he was not asking me to do anything illegal and moral or against my, my Christian beliefs. He was asking me, help me out. I'm like, okay. I'll do it. So we started the organizational assessment. I learned a lot. I think I learned more than what I was able to give. I did a presentation, gave a report. And you know what? At the end of all of that, I thought that was the end of it. But reality was God had a different plan. As a result of that, we got invited. I got invited to go back and train police officers. So I told you, I don't know how to do that. 
<laughs> so I talked to our police officers here, and I took five really of the big ones with me <laughs> from Dallas back to Belize. And they were training them on the latest techniques, and they took equipment, and they donated equipment. And I remember one thing that brought tears to my eyes was when they all stood up, and I had the chance to pray for over 300 police officers. The kingdom of darkness was being pushed back. The work of justice, the work of the Lord was being done. Why? Because sometimes God has a different plan than what you see in front of you. God will use the good ones and the bad ones and everyone in between, but he calls us to honor civil authority. And it's easy to do that when they're in the same political party that I am and when they have the same agenda that I have. But you know what? Peter had something to say about that. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. So far, so good, right? <laughs> so far, sounds really dandy, really good. Fear God. Perfect. I'll do that. Honor the emperor. <laughs> do you know who he was talking about? King Agrippa in the first century, historical king. Under the authority of the emperor. He said, honor the emperor. King Agrippa was killing Christians as a hobby. King Agrippa would kill Christians who were the minority to gain favor from the political majority who were the Jews. Are you with me? And Peter walks into that situation and says, honor. By the way, honor your family, fear God. And by the way, honor the emperor. <laughs> it's so easy to do that. When we agree, give honor even when it doesn't make sense. That's civil authority. Second one I want to share with you is honor familial authority. Honor familial authority. Honor your children. Honor your children. Scripture gives us really good guidelines. Direct your children onto the right path, says the book of Proverbs. I've, I've met parents who are like, well, I don't want to impose anything on my children. They really could do whatever they want. And I've seen relationships where the child has become the parent, altering God's blueprint for the family structure, ordering, uh, I mean, affecting and altering God's blueprint for the way we ought to relate to our kids. It says instruct them, guide them, dedicate time to them, love them, show respect to your kids, show respect and honor to them. The way you dedicate time, the way you show how to be a leader in your family it says honor your children. Another type of honor is honor your parents. And I love the way scripture lays that and the way Paul describes that. He breaks that down in two really good pieces. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1 to 3 says, children, obey your parents. It means if you're under 18 in our context, right, the United States, if you're under 18 and you live under their roof, the way you honor God is by obeying your parents, whether you like it or not. My mama used to say, if you don't like it, leave. <laughs> but until... You live under my roof. I pay the rent. I pay the utilities. If you don't like it, you could do it on your own. I didn't. But does that make sense? When you're living at home, whether you like their decision or not, the authority that has been delegated from God over your life is your parent. That trumps culture. That trumps your friends. And it trumps your preferences. I know there are parents that are not the best parents. I understand that. But we still have to honor those. There's a, that's another message. But what happens when you become 18? <laughs> you become 18 and you leave the house, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. Pray for that, every parent. <laughs> but if you're 30 and still living at home and they're meddling into your business, you deserve that and more. You deserve it. You deserve it. You don't like them meddling, just leave. You should have left a long time ago. Anyways. Proverbs 22, 6 says, if you're an adult paying your bills and a responsible adult and you've left your parents' house, which is the way it should be, it says, honor your parents. Every season, in every season, you honor your parents very differently. In, when you're an adult, you look ways to show honor. You call them, you hear their stories 55 times, sometimes per week. That's a way to show honor. They were people that led, they led families and they led businesses. And today, they're wondering if they're, any, if they're worthy, if they're any good. So it is our responsibility to still show honor towards our parents. It, we show honor a lot of times establishing healthy boundaries with our adult parents. Are you with me? 
<laughs> when you got adult parents and they're still meddling into your, into your marriage and manipulating and playing the courts because they give you money, first, don't take the money. And secondly, <laughs> cut the cord and honor them. Honor them. Honor them. Honor looks different. Honor your grandchildren. You may think they're just, they're just on those tablets and phones. Honor your grandchildren. Pursue them with passion. They need you more than you think. They need your wisdom. They need your guidance. They need your life testimony. They need your love. They need your experience. They need you to, yes, love them. They need you to nurture them and spoil them. That's what I guess you do with grandparents and grandparents do with kids, grandkids. But also, let them know the legacy of God. Be honest with them. You may seem all holy today, but you are not all holy at 1720. I mean, show them the truth. Let them know you have failed too. Don't look almighty and holy. Let them know I have failed too, but the blessing of God is up on your life generation after generation because of Jesus Christ. Honor your spouse with your words, with your thought, with what you're watching when nobody's watching, what you're saying when nobody is listening. Honor your wife in thought, in word, in deed, in action, in thought, in prayer. Honor them. That's, 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 that's that. Honor your family. <laughs> Third, honor social authority. Honor social authority. And those are your bosses, your teachers, your coaches. In First Timothy, Paul is writing to Timothy, a young man, and he, he writes this great letter, but it's so useful to us. And he says, let as many bond servants... As are under the yoke, count their own masters as worthy of all honor. And those of you that were thinking, oh, you just haven't met my boss. She is a beep, 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 right? <laughs> you just haven't met her or you haven't met him. But he's writing to Timothy and it says, Masters are wor worthy of all honors so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. There is a transcendent truth in this passage that says you don't work for your boss. You work for the Lord. <laughs> and all authority has been delegated from God, including your boss that you don't like. But I'm going to use your boss to grow you, to develop you, and to lead you towards the purpose that I have and the destiny that I have for you. Paul is telling Timothy... Tell the bond servants. You know what a bond servant is? A slave. And he is saying the slaves are to give their masters all honor. It doesn't get any worse. You think, oh, I thought I was at the lowest point of the lowest. No, he is saying slaves give all honor. They're worthy of all honor. That's what Paul is saying there. What if your key to amazing Jesus is walking into work tomorrow and honoring your boss and treating them better than you would treat yourself. What if the key to honoring Jesus is that teacher that your kids got that year that you don't like because you know their reputation? And you go and you honor them in front of your kids and you honor them before the Lord and you honor them in your thought process? What if it's your way to amaze Jesus is by honoring that umpire that makes the call that you didn't like <laughs> and you honor that umpire? We do this. Why? So that the name of God, listen up, not because you like it, you do this so the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. Okay, the last one. Church authority. Church authority. Those are your leaders. Those are preachers, teachers, group leaders in our context. And when Paul writes again to Timothy in his letter, he puts this one in a category all of its own. All of its own. He separates this one from everything else. He says, bond servants, your masters are worthy of all honor. Now, he's teaching about church authority. And this is what he says in 1 Timothy 5.17. The elders who direct the affairs of the church, well, <laughs> well, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor. Actually, there's no other place in Scripture that it talks about double honor. There's no other place. And it says, especially those who work in preaching and teaching. Honoring church authority doesn't have to be weird. I've seen stuff over the years. Honoring church authority 
Honoring your church leaders doesn't mean carry their briefcase, park their cows, and some other weird stuff that people do in churches. That's not what honoring church authority. Honoring your pastor, honoring church authority is praying for your pastor. Honoring church authority is planting roots where you are and avoiding the flip-flop in your life. It's walking in unity and not in disunity. It's jumping in because you've been gifted gifts and talent and life experience and opportunity. So get involved in the local church. It's staying the course, being steady when things are uncertain, not just for the sake of honoring the pastor, for the sake of your own family. Stay hungry for the word of God and stay growing, stay alive. Let your prayer life be dynamic. Honor God, honor your leader. This is how we honor spiritual authority. But you may be on the other end of the spectrum where you have been hurt by church authority. <laughs> and the church leaders you know are not even worthy of those, of those things because they have hurt you, spiritually manipulated you, didn't keep their promises. But listen to me today. Don't abandon the heart of honor because someone in your spiritual authority didn't understand the heart of God. Don't abandon your heart of honor because someone in your spiritual authority didn't understand the heart of God. The reason it's so hard for us Christians and culture today to honor is because we have worshipped people that we were only meant to honor. We have worshipped people that we were only meant to honor. In election cycles, we have worshipped political figures that we were only supposed to honor. We have worshipped our party and our party line when we were only supposed to honor. For some of us, it's hard to honor because we worship our spouse or we worship our children or we worship our marriage, and that led to disappointment and destruction and hurt and pain, but we were only supposed to honor. We worshiped that teacher that helped us in a difficult time. We worshiped our coaches that made us feel important. We worshiped that boss that gave us an opportunity. Give honor to whom honor is due. But don't give them what has been reserved for God. Worship is His and His alone. Forever and ever, we will, worship, we will worship God. Forever and ever, we will honor people. There's a big difference, and don't get them confused. The challenge with a message like this, and I'm about to wrap up, is this. You're like, okay, I got to go honor my spouse, my children, basically everybody, okay? <laughs> Just copy and paste. <laughs> that list is great, but it will only last a week. Because true honor originates in the heart. True honor is not a behavior. True honor is about transformation. True honor comes by understanding the heart of God towards honor, even with those that he was in disagreement. It's honoring those that he chose to delegate authority to, although their, be their behaviors may be wrong. It's about to getting more of Jesus in you. So that I could get God's heart for honor. So then I could go and honor those where it, sometimes it hurts the most. Where someone has hurted you. When someone has neglected you. Or someone in your life has impacted your biblical definition, definition of, of honor. Just, if you sense something in your heart that you have not been walking in this type of honor that I've been talking about today, I just want to invite you just to a moment of reflection and a moment of prayer. Do this internal audit and say, Lord, first of all, I need more of you so that I could walk in that kind of honor. Because I've been walking in so many other ways that are not biblical, but more cultural than biblical. And today I've been challenged by your Holy Spirit, by your word. And I want to I take what was from the Lord. And that's, that's been my prayer. Lord, teach me how to honor better the people that you have placed around me. Father in heaven, I ask that you will forgive us for not valuing men, women, and children the way you value them. Today, Father, I pray for everyone in all of our campuses, across Wiley, Garland, Hughes, and here in Saxe in our online campus, I pray, Lord, that we will make 
more room for Jesus, that we will invite Jesus Christ to be the Lord of every area of our lives. And that from this day forward, we will value those that you placed in our lives the way you value them. God, I'm asking you to put honor in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.